Council of World Affairs, India's oldest think tank on foreign policy issues. Its principal objective is to promote study of international relations and development and to act as a repository of knowledge and thinking on world affairs. The Council has hosted numerous heads of states and governments and foreign dignitaries in the past. Today, we are honored to have with us His Excellency Nikola Selakovic, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Republic of Serbia, who will be delivering a special lecture on India-Serbia relations, state of play and future potential. The program will begin with welcome remarks by Mrs. Vijay Thakur Singh, Director General Indian Council of World Affairs. This will be followed by remarks from His Excellency Sinika Pavik, Charge the Affairs, Embassy of Republic of Serbia, New Delhi, followed by His Excellency's address, which will be followed by a brief question and answer session. I would now request Mrs. Vijay Thakur Singh, Director General, Indian Council of World Affairs, to kindly deliver her remarks. Now. Good afternoon. It gives me great pleasure to welcome His Excellency, Mr. Nikola Selakiv, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Serbia, to the Indian Council of World Affairs. Your Excellency, we would like to thank you for taking time to be with us today, despite your very busy schedule. We are honored with your presence. India and Serbia have historically enjoyed warm and friendly ties. As co-founders of the Non-Aligned Movement, we have shared deep and close friendship. In the past few years, there have been high-level visits. Vice President of India visited Serbia in 2018, and earlier, Prime Minister of Serbia was in India in 2017. Over the past few decades, our economic partnership has expanded and diversified to various sectors, including information technology, pharmaceuticals, infrastructure, and agriculture. We have strong cultural, academic, and people-to-people -people ties. Serbia is the only country in Europe that allows visa-free travel for Indian passport holders and for stay up to 30 days. This has contributed to building people-to-people -people closeness. A large number of Indians have been visiting Serbia, and at the same time, a large number of Serbians have visited India for business and cultural purposes. Our relations, therefore, are underpinned by great admiration among our people for each other. Vice President of India, who is also the President of the Indian Council of World Affairs, said in his visit to Serbia at the special speech at the session of Parliament of the Republic of Serbia in Belgrade in 2018, and I quote, Our ties started on a strong foundation of shared global view of non-aligned movement, and we together created a platform for the third world uh, countries. The changes in global geopolitical politics now give us an opportunity to work together for mutual benefit and for sharing prosperity with others." Unquote. Excellency, hence our relations, as you would know, are, uh, there is a natural partnership between our two countries. India sees Serbia as a gateway to Central Europe, building upon each other's strengths and with our commonality of views on global, uh, major global issues, we can take our relations to a new era of political, economic, and commercial collaboration. And it is in this regard we look forward to hearing your views on India-Serbia relations, state of play, and future potential. Excellency, Minister, I would like to once again extend a very, very warm welcome to you. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, ma'am. I would now request His Excellency, Sanika Pavik, Charge the Fair Embassy of Republic of Serbia, New Delhi, to deliver his remarks. Thank you. Honorable Minister, respectable Director General, respectable members of delegation following uh, Minister Selakovic, Dear colleagues, ladies, gentlemen, one, in, one year ago I came uh, 
in India as a diplomatic representative of my country, of Republic of Serbia. And uh, since that moment, I became a Delian. Sharing with uh, our uh, Indian friends all the challenges of actual moment, starting with uh, all the challenges with the coronavirus that we spent together here. And uh, coming here, I was completely confident that uh, miles separate us. And then coming here, and after uh, this one year, I realized that it is the only thing who is uh, separate us. All other things connect our two countries and our two people. Respect of tradition, history, and the love for freedom are uh, the most important common moments, in my point of view, between our two people. But in any relation, it is uh, necessary to progress. And progress in this kind of relation is strongly connected with communication and possibility to share common views and present our common interests. And simply to have a feeling of closeness and brotherhood. That was the main goal we had in mind preparing this visit of our foreign minister. And uh, I am completely self-confident that uh, after uh, the lecture of our uh, here present Minister Selekovic, you will share my impressions. So thank you for the opportunity and uh, I am really uh, touched with and uh, I wish to all of you, people who are uh, together with us here and all those who are uh, following the transmission of this event, that at the end they'll uh, uh, feel uh, uh, Serbia just in this part of their body. So if someone asks them tomorrow, okay, that was a lecture about Serbia, where uh, Serbia is, they can simply put their hand here showing the position of Serbia. Thank you. May I now request His Excellency Nikola Selakovic a Minister of Foreign Affairs, Republic of Serbia, to deliver his remarks. Thank you very much, Madam Distinguished Madam Director General. Your Excellencies, dear friends, dear Indian friends, it's a great pleasure and honor for me being here today, and it's also a great challenge because I'm somehow Recalling on uh, my professional starts, I started my career at University of Belgrade School of Law and I was teaching legal history in that time. And uh, especially when I've been dealing with ancient cultures and civilizations, uh, it was almost impossible to miss your great civilization, your great country, your great nation. Today, in a position of a foreign affairs minister of my country, I am having this honor given to me, and not only to me personally, more than that, it is given to a foreign affairs minister of my country, the Republic of Serbia, by its population, by its territory size, a small west, south 
Eastern European country. But uh, looking at our relations, the country which is so strongly connected with the Republic of India and with, it, with, with its people. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank to your state leadership, to your foreign affairs minister, to whom I met yesterday evening, to your director general, who is hosting me here today, and especially I am going to, 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 to show and to express all my gratitude uh, to the Honorable Vice President, whom I'm going to meet this evening before my departure from India, for the honor given to me, which is showing actually the real nature of your great country. Why Serbia is willing to cooperate with India? Why India is a great country? One of the reasons, there are many of reasons, there are dozens of thousands, of hundreds of thousands of reasons. But you know, when, when you're representing a 7 million people country, and you are hosted in 1.3 billion people country, in a way you are hosting myself and my delegation, then you are showing actually how your country is great and that you are not counting countries and peoples only through figures. Our two countries are having a long and good tradition of cooperation. There are many common characteristics of our people. We are both freedom-loving nations. And uh, we have been fighting, struggling for our freedom for decades, and for centuries. And one of the key moments for the history of our relations, which is making our relations friendly, cordial, traditionally very good, has happened actually 60 years ago. 60 years ago, great leaders of our countries has gathered, and uh, they have gathered in our capital, in Belgrade. And the purpose was laying in the fact that a uh, little bit before that, they met in Bandung. They've uh, defined some of the key elements and values to which the future non-aligned movement has to be dedicated to. And after that, they've organized the first non-aligned movement, the founding conference in the capital of that time, Yugoslavia, today Serbia, to found that movement. In that particular moment, the world was divided. It was a bipolar world and our leaders from the Indian side, it was Prime Minister Nehru from Serbian Yugoslav side, it was the late President Tito. Together with leaders from Indonesia, Ghana, and United Arab Republic, they have shown to all the world their wisdom in searching the third way, which is not going to be supportive to any one of these two blocks. And this period of world his, world's history has been existing for a while, has been existing for three decades. It's through these three decades, so between 1961, 1991, the cooperation between the Republic, the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia and the Republic of India was uh, really frequent, really alive. We have been sharing many common interests in the field of politics, in the field of trade, economy, culture. And then what happened after 30 years? Then this blocked separation of the world has fallen down. The so-called Iron Curtain fallen down. And uh, just after that, during the following years, one of the actors on the international political scene 
one of the most important factors together with India, Egypt, Indonesia, in NAM has fallen down. And the first casualty of these changements in the world was the Social Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. The Republic of Serbia, which is one of, of five successor states, but in the same time the biggest one, in the same time the only one who, which has invested its statehood in Yugoslavian statehood, because Serbia used to be the kingdom if, before the, the First World War as an independent state. Serbia was searching for its way during the next 30 years. So this year, in October 11 and 12, in Belgrade, we are organizing a commemorative conference on the occasion of 60th anniversary of foundation of non-aligned movement. Today, Serbia is a country devoted to the accession process to the European Union, willing to become the part of European Union. But in the same time, Serbia is the country which is the only one in the region, the only one in the broader region, keeping and preserving its position of military neutral country. Almost all of our neighbors are members of the NATO. Serbia is not a member of the NATO, and Serbia is not willing to become its member. In the same time, Serbia is preserving its multi-vectoral foreign policy. What does it mean? You have the other countries which are following 100% everything what is, uh, let's say, positioned as the crucial foreign interests of Western countries. Serbia is trying not only to keep and to preserve its connections, its friendly, traditionally friendly connections with uh, the countries worldwide, but we are trying to improve them. And this visit of mine to the Republic of India is one of the efforts given to improve our bilateral relations. Where is the perspective of these relations? Our charge d'affaires mentioned that there are uh, thousands, thousands of miles separating Serbia and India. But if I may say, there are hundreds of common interests, common goals. There are hundreds of our common characteristics which, are, which we are sharing. We have passed through terrible 90s in which all the civilian wars on the territory of former Yugoslavia resulted with the dissolution of this big state. We passed through ter terrible 2000s in which our economy uh, was trying to survive the economic transition from the socialist country to the capitalistic country. And uh, one of the crucial moments in in our modern history, modern political history, happened seven years ago. I've had that honor to be a part of it and uh, to witness it and to take, actually to take the participation in some of these events. In 2014, the legislative elections happened in Serbia, but when the new government has took the office, right after that, only two weeks after that, we have been uh, tackled with terrible, terrible floods, which pushed down our GDP, which was already really low. It was uh, in the recession. It was counting the minus. And uh, I like to give to all my counterparts to whom I am having the, the opportunity to talk a couple of information, a couple of data which are showing actually the real situation in which we were, we've been in that time. First of all, we've been, as I said, in the recession, our GDP growth was minus 3.6%. And in the same time, I'm going to give you the existing data on this. So only seven years ago, it was minus 3.6%. Uh, this year, according to the predictions of IMF, we are going to end 
with at least plus 6.5 percent. Our predictions are even better. So some of our experts are saying that it is going to be plus 7 percent. So in the seven years from minus 3.6 6 to 6 plus 6.5 percent. The GDP, the public, sorry, the public debt was seven years ago 79 percent to GDP ratio Today, it is 52% to GDP ratio. In that time, the unemployment rate was 26.9%. Today, the unemployment rate is 8%. And in that time, we have been at the, at the bottom of the list by the attraction of foreign direct investments in our economy. Last year, in spite of all the COVID-19 uh, terrible events and impacts on our economies, last year we have ended the year with uh, the growth rate, which actually shown the strength of our economy. But last year we have attracted 61% of all foreign direct investments in our region. So on one side, in, in our region, you have uh, these five countries recognized as Western Balkan countries. So on one side, you've had Serbia attracting attract, 61% of all, all FDIs. On the other hand, you've had Bosnia and Herzegovina, Montenegro, North Macedonia, Albania, all of them together attracting 39% of the FDIs. So this is the situation in which we are right now. Something what is uh, one of the advantages for our cooperation in the future is dealing with the digital industry, with modern IT technologies. We are investing a lot in this sector and we can learn a lot from your country, especially in this sector. But Serbia used to be before the agricultural country. Still, agriculture is contributing to our GDP of about 9.8%. Four years ago, IT industry has not been almost existing. Today, they are contributing to our GDP with 5.5%. So it is rapidly developing. One of the reasons our the reforms and changements in our education system. We are the first country in the broader region, so in all the Balkans, and also we can compare ourselves with some Central European countries. We are the first country which introduced informatics as a mandatory subject in our elementary schools. And last year, we've had the first generation which graduated. So our youngsters, for a while, and within a few following years, are going to become the best educated in the broader region. These are all some comparative advantages of our economy. Sorry for bothering you and speaking so much about Serbia, but I think this is important for you to get known to see what can we do in the future. If I may say, we've had excellent, really excellent meetings yesterday with uh, the Honorable Minister, today with the State Minister, and we have been talking about uh, all the possibilities of our cooperation in the future, but also defining some of the real tasks for our two ministries on which we are going to work in the com during the coming period. One of the aspects which is showing how our relations are firm, how they are friendly and how they are uh, having an excellent perspective is the support given by the Republic of India to the Republic of Serbia, especially on the political ground. Our country, and I have to, I cannot miss that, our country is faced with a problem, with an issue, 
which is not existing uh, in Europe or in our region. That's the issue of our southern province, Kosovo and Metohija. Actually, what happened in, during the 90s, our southern province, which is predominantly populated with the Albanian population, uh, has been faced with uh, one uh, military uprising of these citizens of ours. After that, when uh, our security institutions, security bodies, try to regulate that, we have been faced with the reaction of a part of a Western world, mainly with NATO, which completely against the respective regulations of the international public law, organized a military aggression on our country. And Serbia, in that time, Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, has been bomb bombarded, bombed, during 78 days and nights. After that, we made an agreement under the auspices of UN. So United Nations Security Council has enacted the resolution 1244, according to which, to which our southern province, Kosovo and Metohija, is an integral part under the sovereignty and territorial integrity of the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia whose successor is the Republic of Serbia. And uh, in 2008, this territory and uh, the local provincial government has proclaimed the independence. So they've been performing one separatist play there, and they were supported by many Western countries, which are recognizing their self-determined status. The Republic of India is one of the countries, friendly countries to the Republic of Serbia, which hasn't recognized that status, which is principally and firmly staying with the Republic of Serbia and supporting our positions. Knowing that fact and knowing the results of the yesterday's yesterday evening, evening meetings uh, with the minister is something what is showing us that in the Republic of India we are really having a strong, friendly country, a strong, friendly nation. And that we are also respecting and supporting your positions in the fight against terrorism in which we cannot say that one terrorism is good and the other one terrorism is bad. No, each terrorism is the same. And that's something bad, that's something negative. That's something what we have to fight against. So sharing the common goals, sharing the same values, sharing the devotion to the freedom, democracy, uh, solidarity, Many of these values were actually the values uh, around which all the non-aligned countries were gathered. We are now uh, at the beginning of the third decade of 21st century in a position to make a survey on our relations and to see where we have to go. Without any kind of doubt, I am quite sure that we have to go together and that we have to cooperate much more in the near, nearest future. Uh, this hospitality shown to me today has to be, at least has to be returned, but it is a difficult task for us. When your honorable minister or some other highly appointed official is going to visit Belgrade, Madam Director General mentioned that honorable vice president has been giving a speech addressing to our parliament, but uh, for the minister, we have to arrange something similar in our Institute for uh, External Affairs and Economy or for Political Sciences. For sure, we have to organize that because we have to exchange our minds and our opinions. There are many important events in Southeastern Europe 
which are having impacts on everything what's going on in Europe, in entire Europe, Central Europe, and all the Balkan Peninsula. There are many events, important, important events, happening in your region of Asia, which are having impact on the world security, and which are at this particular moment maybe more actual than ever before. And everybody are speaking about your neighborhood. And it is really important for all of us to get known what are our views, what are our positions. And not only to say, to say that and uh, to listen to each other about that, but also to listen to your positions. Because two friendly countries are also somehow there to help each other Giving, the, giving to each other the information which can be really important for decision-making process. For sure, what we have to do much more about, and we have defined that. First of all, we have to work much more on people-to-people -people connectivity. Something strange happened. When all the world tackled, was tackled by COVID-19, Indians started coming to Serbia. And during the first six months of this year, we have increased the number of your tourists for 998%. Of course, the starting figure was pretty much low, but this grow, growth is, is counted only in the first six months of this year. And we have to work much more on that. Why? Because in such a way, especially young generations, are going to meet our culture, are going to meet uh, our living habits, are going to find out some of the opportunities for the cooperation in different fields. And that's what one ordinary person can do and how can she, he or she contribute mutual, in mutually beneficial uh, uh, projects. Second of all, not only tourism. Tourism can be just a trigger for, get, for, for letting people to meet the other peoples from the different countries. But also to define some of the real possibilities for our cooperation. I'm quite sure, and especially after this lesson today, I'm going to inform our respective institutes that our institutes, that our councils have to cooperate we have together all our young scientists, all our young researchers. You should come to Belgrade. They're from, from Belgrade should come here to Delhi and to discuss on the specific issues. Also, we have to, to uh, gather our universities. That's what we have been talking about. And not only about social sciences. We have been talking about the establishment of one cooperation, close cooperation of our universities in the field of pharmaceutical uh, production, of pharmacy. It's one of the fields in which your country is making the best world results. It is the same with IT sector, with digital technologies. But it is also about something on which our lives are depending, and it is not only pharmacy, but it is the food production, agriculture, and this, this, everything of this what is going to be needed in the future. For these reasons, and for many other reasons, it is really important to keep the tendency of our meetings on the highest and high level of our leaderships. Being quite frankly with you, I have used the opportunity, the rare opportunity which was given to me meeting your foreign affairs minister to ask him about different regional issues on which we are having the lackness of knowledge. It is also one of the reasons for our meetings. And as usual, as frequent as we are meeting, 
our positions are going to be shared much more in the future. As a country which is nuclear power, as a country which is figuring 18, more than 18% of the world population, as a country which is fastly developing, you know, knowing that you have uh, figured the growth in the first quarter of this year, which is of about 20%. That's something fascinating. And of course that we are interesting, interested to be together with our Indian friends and uh, to make our cooperation to make our cooperation much better, to upgrade it on a higher level and to give it a completely new quality. Uh, I know that our time is limited, but uh, it would be great if I can have some of your questions because uh, the lesson is not just about listening to some who is giving the lesson but also having a good and fruitful discussion on different issues which can be the issues of, of the common interests. So once again, Madam Director General, I would like to thank you for the warm hospitality, for organizing such an event. Uh, in the circumstances in which the world is still trying to survive. And uh, I'm really hoping and looking forward to seeing you in Belgrade. Once again, thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your very insightful remarks. As His Excellency has agreed to take a few questions, the floor is now open for discussion. Kindly introduce yourself and ask your questions, please. Wait, wait, wait. Um, I'm Vivek Mishra from the Indian Council of World Affairs. Uh, it would be great to have what uh, have your views on what Serbia thinks about the Indo-Pacific. Thank you. Okay. So we'll take the questions collectively. Please, next question. Thank you so much, sir. My name is Tuti Banerjee. I'm from the Indian Council of World Affairs. Uh, my question is with respect to migration. So we have thousands of migrants who are coming into the Balkans from the Middle East, from Africa, and Asia in an effort to kind of go on further into Western Europe. Now, as nations are closing down borders because of COVID and other reasons, what is Serbia's present approach to handling the migrant uh, crisis, taking into account the changing circumstances in Afghanistan, the COVID situation, and as you just rightly pointed out, the growing uh, economy in Serbia. So will the migrant uh, crisis have a strain on the economic conditions in Serbia? Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. My name is Sankal Gujar. I am a research fellow here. Chancellor Merkel recently said that if conditions for accession are met, then the EU should keep its word. So what are your comments about this? If you may, please, just repeat. Repeat, repeat. Okay, if conditions for accession to the EU are met, then the EU should keep its word towards Serbia. That is what she said. So what are your comments about this? Mm. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. I'm Anvesha Ghosh, a research fellow at the Indian Council of World Affairs. Uh, how does Serbia look at uh, the recent developments in Afghanistan? And what are your major concerns per per pertaining to the Taliban-led Afghanistan? Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency, for the excellent presentation. Uh, I have two uh, small queries. You beautifully brought back the memories of non-aligned movement, uh, which was established 60 years ago at uh, Belgrade. Uh, my question is uh, uh, your comprehensive relationship with many of nine countries, and also you have uh, uh, initiated uh, very good programs such as a scholarship for uh, students of uh, member states of NAIM. Uh, whether uh, it conflicts with your European perspective in any way, and that is uh, number one. Number two, as you are aware, 
there is a serious debate about the 17, one, 17 plus 1 initiative uh, in recent times. Uh, so what is your uh, country's perspective on that? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, I was also asking a question about the accession to European Union. So uh, how is Serbia looking at the developments that are happening in the Union over the last few years? First of all, I would like to thank you all for excellent questions and uh, of course they are different questions some of them are specifically connected with the uh, with the Serbian position on its own future the future which is uh, searched within the framework of European Union as uh, a country which is willing to become the member state of the European Union some of them are dealing with uh, your regional issues and our position positions Regard, uh, regard these issues and uh, also about uh, the multilateralism and multilateral cooperation under the auspices of different foras. Is it non-aligned movement or some regional initiative such as uh, 17 plus one is? So I would like to try uh, to answer on all of them starting from the first one which is the Serbian position regarding uh, in the Pacific region. What I would like especially to, to focus on is uh, that Serbia is uh, somehow uh, pending on the information which we are having from that part of the region. This is a result of a withdrawal of our state which happened uh, in the first round at the beginning of 90s. Uh, actually, the withdrawal of, the withdrawal of the Indo-Pacific states from our capital, from Belgrade, when mostly uh, their diplomatic missions were uh, resettled, were resettled from, from our capital and uh, positioned in some other regional centers. And also at the beginning of 2000s, when our diplomatic missions have been withdrawn from that region. Uh, if I may say, it was one of the fields of my interest during the talks I've had in Delhi uh, and to see for different opinions and uh, different visions. Uh, we are, as a country which is re-establishing its political and uh, economic power and influence, we are firmly interested to see where we have to uh, re-establish our diplomatic presence. Uh, in the Pacific region is for sure one of these regions. At this particular moment, in this region, we are having only two embassies. One is in Jakarta and the other one is in Rangon. Knowing the, the actual situation in Myanmar, this embassy uh, is not in a position to, to perform fully according to its uh, uh, tasks. So, more or less, we have only Jakarta. And what we have to do and what we are reconsidering now is the re-establishment of some of our missions in the region. It is going, for sure, it is going to be helpful to us in uh, positioning ourselves in the future regarding the different issues in that region. Uh, I would like just to broaden my answer a little bit, comparing it with some other region. Serbia is one of the rare countries you should find, which is having extraordinary good relations with almost all the countries from the Gulf. We are having good relations with Saudi Arabia, with Iraq, with Kuwait, with the uh, United Arab Emirates, with the Islamic Republic of Iran, with Qatar. And I have named almost all the countries in which we are having our embassies. 
We do not have embassy. We are now going to open our embassy in Bahrain. And uh, we are also reconsidering the idea of our diplomatic presence in Oman. So you can see that this diplomatic presence of our ministry, of our government, our country, is actually helping us to have a clear positions on the regional issues, but also to keep good relations with everybody, which is not so common for the other European states. And as a kind of a precondition, we have to be present again in the region, and then we are going to deal much better with all these regional issues. Um, when you ask me about the Serbian approach to the migrant crisis, you should know one, only one detail about our modern history. During uh, the second part of 90s, Serbia was a hub for more than 850,000 refugees. In that time, it was 10% of our overall population. And uh, we have been always considering the issue of migrants as a humanitarian issue. But you should also know that we are, we are just, a, just in a position of a transit country speaking about these recent modern waves of migrants. Because mostly they are willing to reach Western European countries, Central European countries, for many reasons, but one of the main reasons are the social aid measures given by these countries. I've been speaking with uh, some of the people here in Delhi and asking about the level of their average salary. And specifically, these people told me that they have uh, the salary which is of about 300 or 400 euros. Do you know that, for example, in Germany, a migrant who is coming to the Federal Republic of Germany searching for, for asylum is going to get monthly 650 euros. And when you count all his members of the families and having a separate measures for the kids and the other one for, the, for his wife or for her, her husband, you're going to see that uh, it's becoming, you know, more profitable to them to come as a migrant than to stay at their homelands and to work. Our position is really clear. We are waiting for the common position of the European Union when it comes, when it comes uh, uh, to the migrant crisis. We have been behaving as a state in one of the most human ways towards these people. Because many of them were coming for, for the different reasons. The war events were some of these reasons. We know how it is painful. We know how, what does it mean when you are having a man who've lost during, if, during the few hours everything what he made and what was made by his ancestors. And one of the one of the evidences of such an approach by the Serbian state was really remarkable during the COVID-19 crisis when we have been the first country which started the vaccination of migrants. I haven't been speaking about the regional policy of Serbia, but there is only one segment, one detail I would like to inform you about is that during the COVID-19 crisis, Serbia was uh, within the thir three European countries which has purchased vaccines. I would like also to take this opportunity to, take, to, 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 to thank and to express our gratitude to your government, to your prime minister, and I have to mention also your honorable minister to whom I've been having the direct contacts for the help given to our country during the COVID-19 and it was the possibility to get your vaccines and to offer them to our citizens. 
But the evidence of our foreign policy is also existing in dealing with such an issues which some of the people are considering as geopolitics and we are considering as a matter of humanity. We have purchased different types of vaccines from different countries, from Western countries, from Eastern countries. And we have offered them to our citizens to freely choose which one they are going to get. In the same way, we have started the vaccination of migrants on our territory, being the first one performing that. And also we have started donating vaccines to our neighboring countries. We have been donating vaccines to North Macedonia, to Montenegro, to Bosnia and Herzegovina, speaking about the region. And after that, we have opened our borders and we have offered to the citizens of these neighboring countries to come to Serbia and to get vaccines for free. And that's how we have actually vaccinated the hundreds of thousands of citizens of our neighboring countries. It was the same approach towards migrants. Speaking about the political position, we are a country surrounded almost from all the sides with EU member states. Our position on migrations is going to be defined fully when the, United, when the EU, European Union, is going to define its unique position. Is it having some uh, impacts on our economy? There were no impacts on our, our economy during all these uh, migration crises. Uh, there were some efforts by, by one of the neighboring states which wanted to close the border, fully close the border with our country, but it hasn't succeeded. Speaking about EU integrations and uh, giving some comments on the accession process, and uh, there were two, two or three differ, uh, similar, similar questions on these issues. Uh, as I told you, the number one priority between our uh, foreign policy goals, so our priority strategic priority is becoming the member state of the European Union. The accession talks in that direction started in 2014. There are 35 negotiating chapters in that process. Until now, we have opened 18 of them. And we are having at this particular moment eight, not eight, sorry, nine new chapters prepared for the opening. Of course, it is not only depending on our side, it's depending on the side of European Union. So European Union has to make decision on that. Then what happened? European Union changed the methodology of the accession process and our country was the first one accepting the new methodology. But we are still waiting for the opening of new clusters or new chapters. At the last intergovernmental conference held in Luxembourg during uh, June this year. The uh, cluster number one was opened, so it means that all the chapters within this cluster were opened before. But actually what is going on? It is not only about Serbia. There are few moments, few details you should know about this process. First of all, just recall on what I've uh, already mentioned to you, Serbia is faced with a problem which is not familiar to any other European country, and it's the problem of regarding our relations with our southern province, Kosovo and Metohija. One of the preconditions put in front of us by the European Union is to normalize our relations with Pristina. Pristina is the administrative capital of, of our southern province. And uh, some of the European countries considering, are considering this as our recognition of so-called statehood, of unilaterally proclaimed independence of, of Kosovo. And there are still five member states of the European Union which are not considering them, uh, considering, them considering Kosovo Albanians as their wish to be considered. So they are recognizing the territorial integrity of the Republic of Serbia. And that's one of the reasons why we are using this term normalization 
of relations and why we are having the dialogue process between Belgrade and Pristina, which, is, which has entered in the 11th year of the process. During the last nine years, and especially during the last eight years, under the auspices of European Union, we have been uh, performing this dialogue. It is a tough and really difficult issue. It cannot be explained in an easy way. But just uh, let me show you what is going on. Eight years ago, it was in April 2013, uh, the authorities from Pristina and the authorities from Belgrade, uh, in the presence of the High Representative for External and Security Affairs of European Union, have signed the first Brussels Agreement. This agreement defined four separate obligations of Belgrade, one, only one unique obligation of Pristina. In the previous period, Belgrade has delivered all four, all four obligations implemented. And the unique obligation of Pristina is not still implementing that. It's, it's to, to found the community of Serb municipalities on Kosovo and Metohija. So, 3,078 days passed from the time they have put their sign on the agreement. More than 100 months have passed and they are still not implementing the agreement and they are not they have not been pushed under any kind of pressure by the guarantee of this accord. So when it is about the accession process to the European Union, there is one specific chapter which is dealing with the normalization dialogue. And there is something what is, uh, what's not having any kind, with, with, uh, any, any kind of connection with Serbia. These are internal disputes and internal issues existing in the European Union between member states. What is completely different in our position, and which is not just about the Kosovo and Metohija issue, is the fact that during the three existing waves of the enlargement of the European Union, the first one which happened in 2004, when uh, 10 Central and Eastern European countries entered the European Union, the second one in 2007, when Bulgaria and Romania entered the European Union, and the last one was in 2013, when Croatia entered the European Union. All these countries were having really simple template of their accession. They've had, you know, like this piece of paper in which on one side they've been having the preconditions they have to fulfill on the other side they've been having the date on which they are going to become the member state. In our case, and not just in Serbian case, but also in the cases of the other candidate states, the situation is following. On one side, we are having preconditions. On the other side, we do not have the date. But speaking about the preconditions, when we fulfill, fulfill something, when we deliver something, then we are faced with a new precondition, which is really, really hard to deliver. But in spite of that, we are delivering. Why it is so hard to be faced with this? Can you just imagine a guy who is running a marathon, and the marathon is of about uh, 41 kilometers, and he or she is running, 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 and then you've arrived on the 40th kilometer, so you have just a little bit more than one kilometer to run, and then somebody is telling you, oh, you have to run 20 kilometers more. So it is really, really hard to survive that. And can you just imagine all the countries from the region waiting to get that status, because they are looking at the other uh, states, which became member states, 
and how it was helpful for their societies, for their economies. And many of, of, of these candidate states were waiting for that moment and in the same, the same time postponing some of the actions uh, in their regional cooperation. And that was one of the main reasons why our president, Alexander Vucic, and that's the guy who started all these reforms from 2014 when he became the prime minister. And he was actually the one, uh, you know, breaking the ice and coming here to the Gujarat Forum in 2017, when our highly positioned officials met for the first time after a few decades. So this, this president, who is the game changer, he invited presidents and prime ministers from the partner, partners from the region together, all together, and to establish one unique regional trade market based on the freedom of movement of people, goods, capitals and services. Prime Ministers of North Macedonia and Albania accepted this invitation. We have started dealing with it from October 2019. The last meeting was held in Skopje, North Macedonia in August this year. And uh, I know, sorry, but you know, I've been teaching at the university and without 45 minutes, nothing is going to end. So I'm going to finish within a few minutes. So we are making this I'm completely sure, excellent regional initiative. We are all devoted to the European accession process, but we are not waiting for the Europe to help us dealing with something what we can do by our own. Uh, there are two more issues, two more questions. I would like just to, to, to give you uh, uh, some responses in a few words. Regional events in Afghanistan. We are one of rare European countries which, have, uh, which hasn't been present in Afghanistan with our troops. In a period of mandate of my predecessor, there were some efforts to arrange negotiations between two sides in Belgrade. And uh, these were the first efforts made in that uh, direction. Uh, what we are seeing now in Europe is that everybody are speaking too much about Afghanistan and uh, that this prob these problems uh, are seen as something which is going to have not regional but the global impacts. Our position is principal and it is existing in each case that we are devoted to the peaceful and diplomatic solutions for each problems. Is it possible to happen here? I'm not quite sure. I'm getting different information from different sides. And if I may say that uh, one of the best conversations on this issue I've had was the conversation with the Honorable Minister Jai Shankar. And I'm appreciating that a lot. Speaking about our relations with non-aligned movement countries, member states, uh, as I told you at the real beginning. It is not just keeping and uh, improving our relations with countries which are not part of the European Union. We are having traditionally good relations with Russian Federation, with the Republic of India. We are having with the, the People's Republic of China, which is uh, present on our uh, trade market as uh, one of the biggest in investors and which helped us in preserving some of parts of our economy which were at the edge of the abyss, like uh, the steel mill uh, or copper mining industry. But Serbia is, an, is a model state for diversification of investors, of sources of energy, of many other, many other important issues. So trying to, to, to give you the answer at once, in the same way we are treating African countries, countries of the Arab world and uh, of Latin America. Just to mention something which, which is going to give you the evidence how it is true. Uh, it was the second part of August this year. I have uh, been visiting uh, different African countries. So in 11 uh, and Middle East countries in 11 days I have visited 
Lebanon, Zimbabwe, uh, Lebanon, Kenya, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Angola, Namibia, Democratic Republic of Congo, Egypt, and Jordan. And we have donated vaccines to the people of Zimbabwe, Zambia, Angola, and Namibia. We have also donated vaccines to Tunisia, to Lebanon, to uh, Iran. And we are proud of that fact because after many years, after three decades, we are again present there when we can help to our friends who've been helping us in the meantime. And uh, we are proud of that. We are not forgetting that, knowing that the gratitude is something which is common to do really short in the international relations, but Serbia is not behaving in such a way. And that's why we appreciate a lot your help and what, why we are not going to forget that. Uh, speaking about the initiative 17 plus one, we are one, I think it is now 16 plus one, but we are one of the countries which is uh, having really good projects in building up connectivity with some of our neighbors. Uh, under the auspices of this format, we are now constructing the high-speed railway between our capital, Belgrade, and Hungarian capital, Budapest. But it has motivated also European Union to be present much more there. And now we are planning the southern corridor, which is going to connect Belgrade with North Macedonia and with Greece. And we are going to do that not in the format 17 plus 1, but in the format of uh, EU member states. So European Union is going to invest that. We do not have such kind of problems. And uh, there are some European partners appearing and saying as you know, if you are participating in this format, then you are going to have uh, financial problems, fiscal problems, your public debt is going to raise. In our case, it is not the, 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 the truth. You can see before entering in this period of our economic recovery, before making these projects, our public debt was much higher than it is now. So it is not about, you know, just one state. It is about your own decision as a state, how you are going to deal with different proposals. Our task is to choose what is going to be the best for our citizens, for our people and for our country and not trading with our friendships. You know, in good as well as in bad times, we have to stay together. We have to, we have to, prefer, to, to preserve our friendships and to, to show to each other that it is something what we would like to say and, uh, save and what we would like to, to upgrade. If there is something I missed, I'm sorry, but uh, it was just uh, the first half time. We are expecting the second in Belgrade. Once again, I would like to invite you all to come to Serbia, to come to Belgrade, to meet your colleagues, to meet different people, to be guests of our ministry, of course. And uh, once again, I would like uh, to thank you, Madam Director General, for this extraordinary, extraordinary event and for this extraordinary opportunity given to me to give a lesson to your people from the Indian Council for World Affairs. Once again, thank you so much. I would like to express a sincere thanks to His Excellency Nikola Selakovic, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Republic of Serbia, for his remarks. I also take this opportunity to thank His Excellency Seneca Pavic and DGICWA for their remarks and our audience, present and online, for their valuable participation. Thank you, and I request everyone to join us in the foyer for tea. Thank you.